Hi, everybody. Hello, SASOPS community. Thank you for joining us for the second edition of A Better Workshops Altitude 2020. Uh, thanks again for joining us for day two. We hope you're finding these workshops valuable. So we're very, very excited to have you join us and learn a little bit more about some cool tips and tricks and use cases that we think that you could start taking advantage of within Better Cloud. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Devin. I come from Better Cloud's expert advisory group, a dedicated team on Better Cloud. Uh, specialize in ramping up new Better Cloud co customers and consulting our current customers in the world of user management, group permissions, user permissions on offboarding, data security and protection, and now even talking a little bit about SaaS discovery today. And I'm joined by my colleague, Justine, who will do her intro. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Justine, Better Cloud's Director of SaaS Ops and Corporate IT. My team handles employee support, office technology, all of our enterprise-wide SaaS apps. And the goal of our team really is to build trust with our employees, drive IT value to the business, and empower our users to just do the best dang job they possibly can. I also co-host the SaaS Ops show with my colleague, Brian Farrell. I hope all of you tune in to our two very special episodes during Altitude. Yes, thanks for joining Justine. Sorry to break up your busy day in SaaS, in SaaS Ops show, but please do check out the catalog on YouTube. They're really entertaining. I've learned a lot of best practices through them, so we really hope you could join the Altitude Edition. So we have a pretty short agenda lined up for today. As you can see, it's only one of, there's two, two major bullet points here. Um, one thing to know is as we're going through this agenda and as we're talking about these different topics, please, please, please feel free to write in questions as we're going along. We have members of our team are ready to answer um, if you have any questions about any of these use cases that we're going to talk about. But broadly speaking, there are going to be two use cases um, that we, two areas of use cases that we really want to focus on. The first one being is without knowing about our exciting announcement about the discovery functionality that Jim had announced this morning, uh, we want to talk about what you could currently discover today using Better Cloud. Um, so things like using our assets grids and using our asset enabled integrations to start getting that insight. And then for part two, I'm going to talk with Justine more in depth um, about effectively how the Better Cloud IT team used our discovery beta to start getting insights about application installs um, living within the SaaS nether sphere. Um, we're hoping by the end of today's session, you're answering some of these burning questions such as which SaaS applications are my users using? Are there ways I could reduce spend for SaaS license costs? And even are there trends in my SaaS assets that may be leaving my organization vulnerable? We know this is becoming more critical and more necessary for IT teams to start implementing. So we're really hoping you have some takeaways from the use cases that we present today. Let's talk about what happens when you start in connecting and installing all of your integration supported assets today. Uh, when I talk about our asset powered integrations, I'm talking about some of those Keystone SaaS applications that we know most of our customers know and love. Things like G Suite, OneLogin, Dropbox, Box, Salesforce, Office 365 and more. Uh, effectively, with, when you install and connect these integrations, we start to preload all of your assets in terms of high-level metadata as it relates to your users and your groups and your files where it's supported. Uh, what we're looking at in this view right now is within our users directory. Um, and effectively, what you're seeing here is a pivoted table uh, connected by, grouped by integration. Which uh, applications do my users currently use uh, when it comes to what I've integrated with Better Cloud. So I'm looking to see if there's any provisioning gaps today between G Suite, Office 365, OneLogin, Slack, kind of you name that application that's asset supported, we will be showing you in this grid which they have pivoted by their email address. Some key things I'm really looking for is I'm looking at some user accounts that I just know by email. Maybe I have a little bit of context of like saying, hey, I know my sales users are supposed to get Office 365 or however they call themselves today, Microsoft 365 licenses to date. Um, so I'm really trying to understand, did I leave any provisioning or deprovisioning gaps open? So maybe I see a user that says, oh, wait a second. I thought this sales user had Office 365. Apparently they didn't. Um, now what I could do is I could select that user, 
pop into my actions engine in the top right and create that Office 365 user and assign them a license. Or let's just say I'm looking through this um, list and I'm like, wait a second, how did somebody outside of my design team that's specifically for using Dropbox actually get a Dropbox license? I don't, I don't remember provision, provisioning that for the user. So what I maybe do is I also may be looking for, for gaps where I'm seeing Dropbox accounts assigned to some users and looking for uh, opportunities to potentially disable or revoke those licenses using this sort of view. Moving on to a next cool use case that you could do with this user's group view. Let's say I decide I want to ungroup by integration. What's awesome now is now pivoted by user email, we're starting to show you some attributes that live on those user profiles down to their account status, their admin or user role, their MFA status, last login. And for those of you taking advantage of G Suite, of course, we do list whatever their org unit that they're um, in. Uh, so it could start to drill down and filter and sort by some of these columns to get more information and insight based off any of these logical groupings. Uh, so for example, in this one, I'm pivoting down by G Suite OU. I wanna be able to take bulk actions such as moving them out of that OU. So in this search, for example, I noticed that I did a search on the root org unit. I know I enforce policies on an org unit basis where I'm disabling certain features features within the G Suite tenant. So anybody who's in the root org or you in my organization may be left vulnerable. So really all I'm doing is trying to identify which users have been left in that root OU and start to take a bulk action of moving those users off to a proper org unit. But I could also foresee other use cases of why you may want to pivot down your users by G Suite OU. Maybe there's a new hip hop and happening distribution group that you had to create for one of these teams. So it may just be easier to sort them all down by OU and take that bulk action. Um, as part of that group ad, maybe there was a manager change or a title change or a department change or even just a nomenclature change in general coming from my HR team. So maybe I just want to sort things down by that OU so I could start mass editing user profiles using the G Suite edit user profile action or even using the Google ad to group action for adding them to that distribution group. Uh, so again, really just being able to pivot those users by that org membership, or maybe there's even like a, a workflow on demand that I need to take. Maybe they're gonna be moved over and go, go through a role provisioning change workflow. So again, I could just see first see a lot of use cases by splitting them down by OU. Another cool use case I could do by pivoting uh, by some of this user attribute data is I could start to look at the last user login date and effectively what this is capturing across a couple of our Keystone applications, such as G Suite, Office 365, and Salesforce, is it's looking at the last time a user opened up an application session using this integration. Uh, this could be giving me insight into what could be potentially some stale accounts that live in these integrations. And of course, one concern I may have in the IT field with my stale accounts is I'm paying for a license for these users. Um, if I'm noticing that they haven't really logged in and used in the past 90 days, I'm kind of begs the question, do they actually really need this application on that frequent of a basis? So I'm really using this view to start to pivot and understand, do I have stale users living out there in my SaaS universe? So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm effectively setting a before date on that last user login to start to look at um, some accounts that maybe in the last 90 days or so and prior to that that haven't logged in and used that. So I'm bulk selecting those user accounts. I'm looking at those users, trying to understand, are they eventually going to use this service? I may decide to reach out to a few of them and decide, hey, I think these are good candidates to revoke their licenses. So what I could do from Better Cloud is I could bulk select and start to use actions like Office 365's from, uh, remove licenses. Or maybe let's say I'm looking at G Suite stale accounts and maybe these have been deprovisioning gaps that have appeared in my environment. Um, or maybe there's some uh, opportunity here to maybe archive some of these users. Maybe they're stale service accounts. Who actually knows? Um, but using this list, I can then make those decisions of what I could take bulk action against and start to revoke licenses or deprovision um, where it makes the most sense. Moving on to another cool use case I could do right from the user's grid. Um, we do pivot on the account status across many of these integrations. So being able to look at suspended status, deactivated status, active user status um, across these Keystone SaaS applications start to also give me insight into which accounts may be stale, uh, which accounts may be causing additional license costs across my environment. Uh, let's take the example of looking at suspended and deactivated status specifically for G Suite. Uh, G Suite has its concept of an archive user license where effectively you're paying less to have that user live within your organization as no longer an active user. However, when they live in your environment as a suspended user, they're taking 
racking up the same license costs as they would as an active user, thus creating all this additional IT spend that we may not necessarily need to have. Uh, so effectively by me pivoting by the G Suite integration, pivoting by that suspended user status, I will now identify all these users that I can now assign that archive user license to and start spending those IT costs today. So I could even bulk select those users right from Better Cloud, pop right over into my actions engine and start to use that archive user license and use the action archive user to effectively bulk archive those users and start to create some license spend right out of the gate. And again, I always think some of these use cases are pretty hard to identify if you're just looking at these individual providers. It's really nice to see this at a glance across many of these integrations and really start to get that kind of insight of how many suspended users, how many kind of stale endpoints do I I have in my users directory just across many of my key SaaS applications. Um, one cool thing, of course, with our users grid is, you know, you get all this insight um, and pivotal by these attributes, but fun fact, you could also do this with your groups as well and start to see this across, um, you know, very common distributions you may be creating across these applications. So when I pop over into the directory groups grid, I'm seeing things like my Google groups, my Slack public channels, my Okta app groups, my Office 365 groups, my S Salesforce roles. And now I'm starting to see a lot more of this inf information at a glance. And I'm starting to understand how many different groups and roles do I actually have living out there in the SaaS nether sphere, as I like to call it. Um, one cool little use case I could do right from here, not a lot of IT, um, group directories I've seen in my life have been that clean, but you could definitely use this as a tool to start to understand how many blind ends do I have in my group directories by sorting this down by groups that contain zero members. Think about what your user experience is when they do browse your group grids, especially now in a remote world where you need to basically join directories and join all these distributions to start connecting with your colleagues today. It would be a bummer if they started joining all these directories and these public channels that effectively had no activity and no members within them. They don't want to talk to themselves, but we want to make sure that IT is offering um, a set of directories and groups where they can actually connect with their peers. So by sorting down by member count, and in this case, I'm doing it specifically for Slack. So I pivoted down by the Slack integration. Uh, I've done everything that has a member count less than one. And I effectively also could show a hidden column that looks at the inactive channels as well. Um, what's going on there is I'm identifying all my empty Slack channels and taking a bulk uh, action on those channels to effectively archive them and keep my Slack directory clean. That way I know when my users join my organization and in a remote world, they know exactly what channels they can start connecting with and start talking to their colleagues. And again, you could, I think, follow suite on this on a lot of your other integrations, get an idea of what empty groups out there that may be for Google groups. Maybe you had X managers ask for these and now they're no longer needed in the directory and need to be cleaned up. I would say the same may go for some, some stale Okta app groups or Microsoft 365 groups. Again, may just be stale from previous processes, but it would be helpful for your user base to have these clean so they look at a very clean group directory when they join your org or continue to use your group directories. And of course, everybody's fan favorite on the secure SKU of our Better Cloud offering. Uh, we start to identify all of these different discrepancies in your file sharing permissions and your file metadata as it relates to Google Drive, Dropbox, Box, files living in your Slack uh, public channels, as well as OneDrive and SharePoint files. Uh, we have the ability to pivot on these permissions on these files and start to look at files that may be publicly shared out um, or maybe files that have been externally shared out with gmail.com addresses that are being used for personal use as well as even going into a deep dive and starting to select files for content scans to look for that really sensitive personally identifiable information like social numbers credit cards um, anything with bank routing numbers kind of, and even now custom data types. So if you have proprietary account numbers, we could do scans for those. Uh, we do plan on covering this feature way more in depth in tomorrow's Better Workshop, but obviously you do want to take advantage of these asset enabled integrations and start getting visibility to public shares today. So in this really basic use case that I'm showing up here, I'm effectively um, looking at the public link sharing across my files for Google, for, for OneDrive, for Box, and for Dropbox, and trying to understand what kind of vulnerabilities am I leaving 
my organization open to. If somebody has this public link or if it's potentially within search results, I may accidentally be exposing customer data or personally identifiable information. And we all know how that ends up for companies at the end of the day. So obviously there's a lot of risks that we need to mitigate here. Um, so I do recommend if you haven't taken advantage of our secure offering yet, do start looking for those public files, start looking for those external files. And of course you could use your Better Cloud's action engines to remove those public links and remove those external collaborators from files that may be risky. And of course, as you started to discover all this information, you started getting these insights about these empty Slack public channels, these licenses of these last login users that have now gone stale, these public files living out in the net, in the um, living out in your SaaS universe, you know, effectively now you want Better Cloud to start telling you about these insights as they come up, and you want workflows effectively to start fixing those issues um, as they are seen. So this is where we start to create those custom alerts that will look for things like your public files living in Google Drive the moment they become public, or maybe looking for those Slack channels the moment that they become empty and have zero members. You want Better Cloud to catch those events and start triggering alerts based off those um, off those SaaS integrations, um, sending those events to Better Cloud, and then you want a workflow to catch those for you as a when statement. And then within then statements with your workflows, either notify you to the condition or take automated actions or even take advantage of Better Cloud semi-automated actions, such as wait for approval and wait for duration to pin certain actions, leave decision points for IT teams where needed, or maybe even other external teams. Um, and effectively start to do things like, for example, when a Google, Google file is shared out publicly, then use a better cloud wait for approval uh, to ask me, hey, here's all the file metadata, here's the name, here's who shared it out, here's the file owner. Given this information, would you now like to take an automated action to remove the public link from that file? And building out a very basic workflow that will start to remediate these issues as they're seen. Um, so hopefully using our dis current discovery functionality around assets, um, using our current alerts to catch those events and then using workflows to remediate kind of helps solve a whole life cycle of events that will you'll be using to secure your SaaS environment. So with that, uh, I want to start talking a little bit more about our new functionality uh, that Better Cloud used using the Discover beta. And with that, I want to kick things over to Justine uh, to talk about her discoveries using the Better Cloud Discover beta. Hi, um, Devin. I love the phrase SaaS nether sphere. I think I'm definitely going to use that moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that I love the most about working at Better Cloud is being able to see new iterations of the product as it's being developed. People in IT in a role like mine can often feel somewhat powerless or at the whims of some powers that be around them. But at Better Cloud, we like to drink our own champagne. So having a seat at the table to directly impact the product uh, makes me feel really special. And also, um, I love to lord it over people. <laughs> So when, um, so just see when the uh, Bear Cloud product team approach you and they're like, hey, we need you to start betaing our discovery tool. Um, how did you and the team decide to approach this? Sure. So first of all, we started with the superstar product and engineering team turning the feature on for us. And we had an initial kickoff call with some engineers and product people to sort of start to share our takeaways and our feedback. The first thing that we were able to take away was the overall extreme number of applications that Discover was able to find in our environment across SSO, OAuth, and the Better Cloud connectors that we have. And that number was way more than we had documented. Just, uh, you know, like a few more, approximately 319. But uh, we were pretty close, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. I'm sure that was a surprise seeing that number of 437 applications discovered. I mean, even before you were using this discovery tool, how are you previously tracking um, new applications entering the um, Better Cloud environment? Well, frankly, a tale as old as time, we were using a spreadsheet in, in Google. And it was, as you might imagine, pretty out of date because it depended on manual updating from our team or depended on direct uh, info from stakeholders who maybe were running around and didn't have time to give us every single detail. But we also used the Flash Panel product for checking out the third-party applications that people were OAuthing with their G Suite account. 
So we were at least able to see how many users were using different applications there and what kind of permission scores those had. But as you can see, uh, more and more applications flow in every single day as people con continue to authenticate to them. A big shout out to Ife, my colleague on the security and compliance team, who has been instrumental in helping us uh, start to review all of these different applications. Yeah, it's exciting to see the number come down from the 400s to having like just even 200s to start to review, um, as well as starting to sanction and unsanction and starting to get some of those insights. I'm kind of curious as you went through these reviews, what were some of the takeaways that you got from that kickoff and starting to go through this process? Yeah, I think one of the biggest takeaways has been simply just to see all of this data in one place and begin to start to digest it and understand it and start to draw a bigger picture of what might be happening across the organization. So for example, one thing that I already kind of knew from our software asset spreadsheet was that people love project management tools. Uh, what's really neat about Discover is that not only can you mark stuff as sanctioned or unsanctioned or in review, but it will also show you redundant apps. So in this example of project management tools, we were able to see how many different kinds we truly had running in the environment. Spoiler alert, it was a lot. <laughs> wow, I feel so that's way more than I anticipated. I know everybody uses their project management tool of choice. I think you would find my name personally under that Trello list. Um, but yeah, wow, that I had no idea there was so much of this activity going on at Better Cloud. Yeah, I, what's so interesting about something like this is that it can spark a conversation for your IT team and the stakeholders at the company. Why are there 15 project management tools? What might that indicate to your team? So I guess when you were starting to go through the project management tool data, like how did you start to frame this? So people talk a lot about shadow IT or uh, SaaS Nethersphere, I guess, going forward um, and how it's the bane of IT's existence. But I've always thought of it more as an opportunity to have a conversation with people. When I see 15 project management tools, I think, what are these teams trying to accomplish that they couldn't accomplish with a sanction tool? Do they even know that there are certain sanction tools that are available for their use? This can be an important point of reflection for yourself just to see how you can serve your employee population a little bit better. And it could go deeper too, right? So 15 project management tools in your organization can be an indication of information silos. Oh, I could totally see that, especially since like people prefer to use their project management tool of choice because they just have the most familiarity and most exposure to it. You know, maybe just helping them on an individual basis. But I mean, the whole nature of a project management tool is we are supposed to be collaborating across departments and working on the same sets of projects with it. So I could tell, definitely see that idea of like information siloing and this need to start to, you know, get that insight to centralization and kind of what is going to be that app that most of our employee population will use for project management. Absolutely. You can also use this data to inform your team's strategic roadmap and help IT become a partner to the business. By seeing these usage trends within Discovery, you can help the business maybe get a better discount on a product that they're using. Or on the other end, if you see that there's a product that people are just not really using that much anymore, not authenticating to, you can make sure that it's not renewed. Totally agree. And kind of also curious, like as, as you're kind of even going past the project management discovery findings, like what else did you also find going through the discovery beta pilot program? <laughs> you can see how many of your users may have used an app that's had a breach, for example. So if you know that someone's had a breach, you can see how many users have authenticated to it. Uh, it's also really neat to see connected apps within apps. Like for example, Salesforce, it'll show you all the different uh, app connectors within Salesforce. Something else we came across a lot as we've been working within the tool is that very often when we reach out to people about something that they're using, they may have used it once, wanted to trial it, never went back to it, but hey, it still has permissions to their account. Might be reading all of their email for some reason um, and they didn't even realize it. So this gives you an opportunity to educate the user on being able to check out these different applications and make sure that they're 
re revoking those permissions once they're done using them. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of opportunities I would see where you get a chance to re-educate the user based off what you're finding in the discovery tool. Um, I would bet that there's a lot of users who sign up one time for an application and they maybe use it once for like a personal thing and then they forget all about it. I mean, is, is that kind of what you were finding as well? Yeah, we've definitely seen that as well, especially in this forced work from home world, the line between your personal life and your corporate accounts might feel a little bit more blurred because, I mean, frankly, you're probably using the same computer, you're not really going anywhere. Uh, so it's been interesting to start bringing attention to these instances and having that conversation with users. So awesome. Thank you, Justine, for um, introducing us to all this cool discovery functionality. We're really excited to have this in the hands of our customers soon. And we hope that you're able to pilot and start using some of this data and getting some of that insight into the SaaS and other sphere, as we like to call it now. Uh, so again, then that thanks for joining us. And that's the time we have today for a presentation. Hopefully we've answered all of your questions and we'll continue to do so. Um, so thank you everybody for following along. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been great to be here and share our experiences with everyone. I hope to see everyone later at the SASOB show episode.